morning, everybody. Thank you, Colin, for your introduction. And as Colin has outlined, there's a huge amount of work that's been going on behind the scenes to reform the governance of the youth justice system. And I'm really <laughs> pleased to be here today in my new role as Director of Youth Justice Policy. And what that actually means is the Youth Justice Directorate brings together policy reform and commissioning teams together into one place in the MOJ, which means we can have a much greater focus on the delivery of the substantial reform programme that we have ahead of us. So you will all be acutely aware it's been a really challenging year for the youth custodial estate. Safety and security are serious and ongoing concerns that are highlighted in the HMIP annual report. And Michael is obviously going to talk to us later about the actions being taken to address concerns in the youth secure estate. But it's clear that further reforms to the system are vital. I was going to tell you about the action we've been taking since the publication of the government response to Charlie's report last year. So we created a youth justice reform programme and a cross-government programme board has been established with representatives from the MOJ, the YJB, the Home Office, Departments for Ed Education and Health, NHS England and representatives from the Welsh Government. And I think this really ensures that we focus on a cross-government approach to tackle this very serious issue. And the programme has two key aims. To make youth custody a place of safety, both for children and for those people who work there and to improve the life chances of children in custody. And to just give you a bit more detail about the programme, we split it into four work streams. So the first of those is an individualised approach. So we're making sure that we've got an integrated framework of care which encompasses education, health and behaviour support into youth custody to ensure that each young person has a full needs assessment and a tailored care and support plan. The second of those, which Colin alluded to, was having a professional and specialist workforce. So actually ensuring that we have a more stable workforce with more staff with specialist skills who want to work with young people and a focus on rehabilitation. Coupled with strong leadership and governance, so we develop strong leaders who create the right culture, who are held, account, held to account for the outcomes that they achieve. And the final aspect of the reform programme is having the right estate having smaller units with more therapeutic environment. I'm sure you'll have seen that last month the Secretary of State for Justice confirmed the government's commitment to investing £64 million to reform youth custody. And with this investment, we will increase the number of frontline staff in youth offender institutions by 20%, employing 123 new recruits. In 2018, we'll be introducing a new specialist role for those working in youth custody and the role will have a basis in youth-specific knowledge and rehabilitative skills. And we're already making progress in this area with 140 current custodial staff enrolled on the Youth Justice Foundation degree. We're also investing in the development of enhanced support units to provide a better environment to meet the needs of the most vulnerable and complex children in our care. And the first of these opened earlier this month at Feltham. The second phase of the reform focuses on the development of the custodial estate and moves towards a long-term vision of having smaller, more strategically located provision and the development of secure schools. And we expect secure schools to be places where children will engage with integrated care, health, education services, as well as physical activity. And secure schools must address a wide range of complex needs and be run by the very best child-focused providers. As, these expert, as experts, these providers will be able to set and adapt the curriculum and timetable to provide activities that best meet the needs of the children. High levels of autonomy provided to leaders must also be matched with high levels of accountability. Secure schools will need to embed in each young person the health, resilience and social skills, which will set them on a more constructive life path. It cannot simply be a rebadging of what we already witness in many parts of the current estate. We want to promote and embed a different culture and a different ethos and they must champion a different approach and deliver better outcomes. We're committed to developing policy alongside our stakeholders. In September, we held a Secure Schools stakeholder event, which was extremely well attended, with representation from a wide range of organisations. It was great to see everyone so engaged and willing to contribute to developing this Secure School concept. And to ensure that the work of secure schools has a lasting effect, we want to see strong working relationships between secure schools and yachts to improve life chances of young people once they're released and to prevent reoffending. We also recently held a successful event on the role of sport in the justice system. 
We're very interested in exploring the benefits that sport can bring, helping young people desist from crime and build positive futures. We've recently commissioned a review of sport in youth justice led by Professor Rosie Meek from Royal Holloway University in conjunction with the National Alliance of Sport. The review is going to audit sports programmes offered to young people in custody and in the community, providing evidence of best practice and where sport works best to support rehabilitation. I know there's a workshop on this tomorrow as well. We very much welcome the review by David Lammy about the treatment of and outcomes for BAME individuals in the criminal justice system. And as Colin mentioned, there's a significant amount of work for us all to do here. We're working to provide a government response that recognises the opportunities for making improvements across the whole system. In his report, David Lammy made the important point we must prevent the young people in the youth justice system becoming the next generation of adult offenders. That's why we're reforming youth justice more widely, prioritising prevention and diversion. Many of you will have responded to the survey earlier this year about gathering examples of prevention work and information about how you work with your local courts. Thank you for doing that. It's really provided us with a wealth of information. And the YJB have recently published a new report which outlines effective prevention practice based on your answers to this survey. Much of the work, however, that prevents young people from offending must start upstream from youth offending teams. Therefore, closely involved with the Department for Education's cross-government protocol to prevent the criminalisation of looked-after children. We've contributed to the Department for Health's green paper on children and young people's mental health. We're also working closely with the Home Office to consider young people at risk of becoming affiliated with a gang and initiatives to reduce knife crime. There will, unfortunately, though, always be some young people who are charged with serious offences. For these people, we need a modern, fair, accessible court system one which is able to deal with cases swiftly and proportionately. With the full support of the independent judiciary, the government is investing over a billion pounds over the next six years to transform the court services. Her Majesty's Courts and Tribunal Service are looking specifically at how our court system of the future can best meet the needs of children and young people who are defendants. Though we'll be making technology more readily available in the courts, I want to assure you that the decisions on how to run hearings remain at the discretion of the bench or the judge who need to ensure that the interests of justice are met. The sentences passed by the courts must provide a route for children and young people who are to be supported and help to change offending behaviour. We're also pursuing non-legislative ways to ensure that sentencing works, that referral order contracts, YORI, requirements and the custodial experience help to address the factors that lie behind offending behaviour and so prevent future offending. I know you've got a fantastic programme ahead of you as Colin set out and I hope you enjoy listening and learning from each other. I'm also really committed over the next couple of days to learning from your wealth of experience and I'd really value your feedback and ideas. I look forward to speaking to many of you over the course of the convention. Thank you. Um, thanks, Claire, for that. So uh, I'm going to hand straight on to Charlie Taylor, our Chair of the Youth Justice Board. Thank you very much indeed. Um, when I last came to this convention, I came to outline the terms of my review and to listen to your views about the youth justice system and what was needed to build on the remarkable successes that you've brought about over the last decade. And I'm delighted to be returning here two years later as chair of the YJB with an opportunity to put into place some of the reforms that I recommended. These changes, outlined by Colin and Claire, will give the Youth Justice Board a new role which takes it back to its founding principles. To monitor the youth justice system and to provide timely and evidence-based advice to ministers. Freed from some of the conflicts of interest that the board had in the past, we are in a position to work with for a better justice system that addresses the challenges of the 21st century. The YJB has a unique place in being able to advise ministers on policy and standards, not just in the Ministry of Justice, but across government, so that the voices and the needs of children in the justice system are not lost. The interviews we've been holding for the new YJB board members have left me hugely encouraged by the high caliber people who are coming, who have put themselves forward for this essential role. And I now want to talk about some of the priorities we have for the board for the next few years. 
First, I want to talk about custody. It's painfully clear that things are not as good as they should be in the secure estate. Peter Clark's annual report painted a stark picture of the state of youth custody in England and Wales. And the Ofsted inspection published this morning of Oak Hill STC shows an unacceptable situation. Whilst the YJB is no longer directly commissioning, I am clear that we still have a role in shaping the secure estate, continually to challenge and question in order to improve the safety, the well-being and the education of children in our care. I'm personally committed to the development of two secure schools and I'm delighted to say there is very strong ministerial support and some excellent work going on between Claire's team in the MOJ and DFE colleagues in promoting the programme. In the meantime, the YJB will continue to work with Michael Spur and the YCS to make improvements in safety and education that are so needed. We must build on the expertise of our best governors and directors to improve practice and to develop a stronger, child-focused culture in these establishments. I'm in no doubt about the challenges, but I'm also adamant that things cannot stay the same. And there are, of course, some exceptional examples of practice in secure children homes such as Clayfields, Barton Moss and Adelbeck, where very high quality staff are able to make huge progress with some of the most complex children. And in our YOIs, governors such as Pete Gormley at Warrington and Jonathan French at Medway are beginning to make some real progress in making children and staff safer and improving access to education and to other services. But we are realistic and we realise we have a long way to go. We must continue to be prepared to assert that in custody and in the community, these are children with ability and potential. We will challenge whenever standards or expectations are lower than they should be for any child. They can never be othered by a system that sees them as somehow different, recognising that despite their difficulties and the terrible things that some of them have done, that they have the same hopes and aspirations as the rest of us, and with the right support, they can go on to become successful adults. We must also do more to improve the resettlement of children when they leave custody. For these children, there are three essential factors which will help to prevent them from falling back into the justice system. They must have somewhere safe to live with adults who care about them. They need meaningful activity during the day, whether it be in education or training or work. And thirdly, they must have access to good quality health care, whether that's mental or physical. Get these factors right and children are far more likely to come through successfully what is often a very risky time. The reoffending rates for children who've left custody remain far too high and the YJB will work with local authorities to make sure that when children are released, they receive the best help and support. We know at the moment there is a disparity across England and Wales in the way that children are resettled and I have a particular concern about those who are looked after. We owe it to the victims of crime to make sure that we do everything to stop children from offending again. And for this reason, I'm keen to build on much of the fantastic work that goes on within youth offending teams across the country. They have done a remarkable job in working with their constituent partners to reduce first-time entrants, to reduce re-offending, and, 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 and to make significant reductions in the youth custody population. Statistics published last week show that first-time entrants to the system have continued to fall, now an 85% decrease when compared to 10 years ago. The average monthly population of under 18s for 2017-18 is 910 young people from a high of over 3,000 uh, 10 years before. But these successes have thrown up challenges on their own. Yacht are now smaller, but they have more complex caseloads, with the children left in the system often having a combination of risk factors. This means that supporting change requires great skill and the involvement of a range of local services. And we know that many of the solutions to youth justice lay outside the system, in health, in education, and in social care. And the numbers of children in the care system ending up in custody remains far too high. Where the state takes on the role of parent, it must do more to prevent these hugely disadvantaged children from being pulled into a justice system. 
Though the overall number of children in custody has fallen, those falls have not been as large in some groups. As David Lammy set out in his recent report, there is now a greater proportion of black and minority ethnic children in custody than there has ever been. And we are looking at the many questions that David has raised and the ways that the YJB can support his agenda. He made one specific recommendation for us, that we independently review the effectiveness of the disproportionality toolkit that we developed with youth offending teams. And I'm pleased to announce that we have already taken this work forward. But I want to do more to build on the collective strength of yachts in England and Wales. I know there's been some excellent work done on peer review, and I would like the YJB to make greater use of the expertise that lies within youth offending teams. Many yacht workers have the experience and the ability to see beyond the hostile behaviour of children, and they have the resilience to keep going despite a child's reluctance to accept help. For some children, the relationship they develop with their yacht worker is the best that they have had with an adult for, any, for, for many years, and in some cases, the best they've had ever. The most effective workers are able to build on this relationship and can often continue to have an input beyond the end of the order that helps the child to get on in their life. The best programmes, such as restorative justice, are used as a scaffold in which to create and build a trusting relationship. We know that many yachts are doing exciting and innovative things. For example, the Enhaced Case Management Programme that follows a trauma recovery model in Wales. And I recently visited Stockport Yacht, where I was enormously impressed by Jackie Belfield-Smith and her team, who, through the Stockport family model, use restorative justice across the local authority to help families to become stronger and more self-reliant. And I saw some terrific work in Manchester in sharing information and intelligence around children who are on the periphery of gangs, working to prevent them from becoming involved with county lines uh, type activities, and considering the use of modern slavery legislation to be able to deal with and address some of these challenges. The y in the YJB, we must make sure we celebrate this sort of work and provide support for successful yacht-generated programmes to be more widely known about and used. In my review, I sometimes heard that the YJB was perceived as a barrier and a block to new ideas. This should never be the case. The YJB will support yacht to develop their practice and never to stifle innovation. As part of our review of national standards, our advice to the Secretary of State will be based on moving away from process towards improving outcomes for children. I'm determined that the YJB will be a powerful resource of data, knowledge and understanding in what will always be a department that is predominantly focused on adults. It has never been more important for, the, for there to be a voice championing the specific needs of children. I wanted this convention to be more sector-led and I'm really looking forward to hearing the terrific range of speakers and presentations that are on offer and also to meeting and listening to many of you. The reservoir of expertise in this room is quite enormous and with your help, influence and advice, we can take on the challenges that face us in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks, Charlie. And, and to complete the picture, I'm going to invite Michael Spur, the Chief Executive of uh, HMPPS. So, Thanks. It's good to be here. It's actually quite a long time since I've been at the Youth Justice Convention, which probably says something in itself. My role today is to speak to you as head of the Majesty's Prison and Probation Service, but specifically to talk about the aspect of the Youth Custody Service that we've created within our organisation. And I have to tell you that when that was floated, I can't say it was an idea I was attracted to initially. I couldn't really see why that structural change we really needed to do. And if I'm entirely frank, I thought I've got loads of other things to be worried about. Actually, is that structural change something that we need? precisely because I thought that way, demonstrates exactly why it was. And I just want to tell you why I think, and I've become more and more convinced, that these changes are right. The YJB has done an absolutely fantastic job 
over a number of years in terms of addressing youth offending in general. And we all know that as a result of that, the young people we're now dealing with in the community, in the criminal justice system, or indeed in custody in the criminal justice system, as a smaller group, but a more intense and complex group of young people. Charlie Taylor talked about that in terms of yachts and, of course, in terms of custody. And his review, it seemed to me, was really timely and important. And I think it's really, really vital that we take the outcome of that review and make it real. And one of the things he identified, which, frankly, those of us in the system knew about, but needed to, to some degree somebody else externally to make it crystal clear, was that the system as it is, having made that vast change in terms of number of young people in the system over years, hadn't adapted particularly in custody to cope with those we're now dealing with. In fact, what we've done was take a lot of money out of the system in custody in particular as the numbers reduced, when in reality the challenge that those young people brought was actually increasing. We've got a much longer sentenced set of young people in custody now than ever before. The average sentence length for young people we're looking after today in the secure sector is 16.1 months. Well, that was the case at the end of last year. That's up from 11.4 months only 10 years ago. And anyone knows about average lengths will recognize that is a significant change. And up from 14.4 months only at the end of 2015. You know, because you deal with the young people, the complexities that they bring. And the reality is the system in custody and in secure care that's been looking after those young people hasn't adapted sufficiently to the changes that have been taking place um, and to the young people that we're now looking after. And those young people, I think, feel much more alienated from society than before, feel actually disaffected to a great degree, and come into a system where, with fewer places, they're further from home, with people who aren't fully um, trained and able to deal with the many complexities that they bring. Charlie Taylor's review identified all of that and absolutely recognized we need to change the approach. And the move towards secure schools is absolutely right. Smaller units of secure schools dealing with the complexities of children with appropriately trained people who can address their needs is something that I and the Youth Custody Service support and will work with our policy colleagues and with the YJB to deliver. But that will take some time. And we have today 990 young people, children, in secure care across the system. 696 of those in YOIs. And we recognize that we've got to do more for those young people. And the system as it was operating was too fragmented. It isn't the case that I didn't care about young people because I didn't come to the convention last year or the year before. It isn't the case that people who work in the youth custody system today don't care about young people. But it is the case that as the system had developed and the pressures across the whole of service delivery, um, certainly in my world and across the ministry, took hold, the reality was that the YJB primarily were left with dealing with the issues about young people. And I certainly, in prisons and probation, concentrated on other aspects of my work, delivering the service as best we could for the YJB, but my focus in prisons and probation was about transforming the probation service and the reforms under the last government on taking cost out of prisons generally. That didn't mean that I or colleagues didn't care. It just meant that effectively we left the main caring to the YJB and did our best within that context. In making the structural changes that the government have done, they've brought together the whole of the custody service and given me a direct accountability for how that system works. And I tell you, that focuses the mind. It makes us think about it in a different way. 
It makes me not say that's the responsibility of the YJP and I'll do my best to deliver against it. It makes it crystal clear it's my responsibility to care for those 990 people in our system and that I need to make sure that that is a huge focus for the agency. One of the concerns was that youth custody services will get swamped within an adult system. Actually, I think the reverse will be true. The focusing of the mind means that I have a director in Mark Reed and his senior management team with Sarah Robinson, who came from the uh, Youth Justice Board, previously in probation, and Cathy Robinson, who came previously uh, as a governor of Feltham, and a team of people solely concentrating on young people across our system. Effectively, in resource terms, significantly higher levels of resource, as it should be for the young people than any other part of the system I'm responsible for. And a very clear focus that we have to improve the outcomes today as we work with our colleagues to deliver the future improvements that will come with that absolutely right reform agenda that Claire outlined. And what are our priorities? Well, I was struck by what Charlie Taylor talked about in terms of what young people need when they're in the community. He talked about a safe place with adults who care for them. That's true in the community. It's absolutely true in secure care, whether it be in children's homes, whether it be in secure training centres, or whether it be in YOIs. He talked about activity in education and work. That's absolutely right for those of us who are looking after children in secure care, providing proper constructive activity Education at the heart of what we do, where young people can develop. And he talked about a health care prov provision that actually takes account of the needs of the young people. And that's, again, absolutely right, given the amount of needs the young people we deal with genuinely have, the levels of um, trauma that they have um, been through, the issues around mental health that we know are prevalent uh, with all the young people that we look after. I'm determined that within the youth custody system, we will operate as a single organisation, a single system, focusing, as the whole reform agenda is about, on the needs of the individual young people, whether they be in secure children's homes, whether they be in secure training centres or in YOIs. I had no... Um, knowledge, really, or interest in secure children's homes. Previously, it wasn't my responsibility. Similarly true for secure training centres. I concentrated on the bit that was my responsibility. We have an opportunity, very clearly, with very clear accountability for the youth custody system uh, within the YCS, to bring a much more holistic approach to the way that we share practice between those sectors to bring people together and look about how we can use the estate, which is far from the estate we would like to have, to do the best we can for the young people in our care. And I'm determined that we will do that, that we'll break down barriers that are there, particularly between secure training centres and YOIs. And one thing's really important to recognise, I read a, a good article yesterday in the and the Guardian about where we are, who talked about secure training centres dealing with um, younger children, um, more vulnerable than those in YOIs. The reality is that that may have been the case when STCs were set up, but actually that's not the case anymore. 95% of the young people in secure care are 15 to 17. 53% are 17, a number are 18. The actual population in secure training centres, the young people we're looking after there, are very similar to those we're looking after in YOIs. And that, frankly, has been one of the challenges for the STCs adapting to that reality. And it's clear that we need to actually work with young people more intensively in smaller units in ways in which we can really try to deal with the individual trauma-based issues that many face and provide opportunities for them to develop as individuals. And we have significant challenges 
with an estate, wirewise, whatever we, however we portray them, look like prisons. We can make them feel different. We can treat people properly as children and work with them as children, but they're not designed in the way that we would want them to be designed. They're not secure schools. STCs are better designed, but again, the, the ethos we need to develop is one that actually, absolutely is about recognising where those individual children are. And yes, having education at the forefront of everything we're doing with them, but realistically uh, setting out achievable goals for those individual young people. 61%, as you know, of children who come into secure care have had little contact, have been absenting themselves from um, education. We're not in education or training at the point they come into the criminal justice system. That's a huge challenge for us. Of course, safety has got to be the first thing that we worry about, and we do every day. And it creates significant challenges and balances that we have to make. At Felton, for example, when the chief inspector commented about the place not being safe, it was significant, actually, that the young people at Felton, when surveyed, felt said they felt more safe than the last time that they'd been surveyed and actually felt more safe than other places across the young people's estate. Why is that? Well, actually, because in order to try and recognise some of the issues that were going on, particularly um, issues between young people in London and gang violence, we ended up with too much time with young people not in enough activity and separated from one another. And that's not the right approach, but it made people feel safer for a period. And what we've got to do is build on that to move to greater integration and more engagement so that people can feel safe operating with others in a more normalised environment that we'd expect to look after uh, for, for children that we're looking after wherever they are. But that's a difficult journey to make. We're determined to do that, to make progress, recognising that it is very difficult across the whole of the secure estate but determined to make impact and change. And that does mean looking at the estate as a whole, building many more opportunities for people to be worked with individually in smaller units. Yes, increasing resource, and I'm really pleased with the fact that the government have put additional resource into the system, it's needed. Increasing resource and increasing capability. The very fact that we've got a workforce that isn't professionally trained to work with children isn't going to be acceptable given the challenges that we have got. And we now at last have 178 staff from across the secure uh, estate sector um, on the foundation uh, justice uh, degree, um, which is being led by Suffolk uh, University. And that's a real step in the right direction. We have lots of challenges ahead. But when I went before the Justice Select Committee very recently, that was actually looking at both children and young adults, and they said, who is accountable for all of this? How are you going, who's accountable for the poor performance that we've got in youth um, establishments? I looked straight at the committee and said, well, that's me. That's our organisation, the Youth Custody Service. And we will work with our critical friends in the YJB absolutely to improve the system. And we'll work with you because we can't do it alone, particularly the links with yachts are really, really key to making this a successful um, service. The change, I think, was timely. The work the Youth Justice Board have done has been fantastic. The unintended fragmentation that we were in, I think, towards the end of that period needed to be addressed. Charlie Taylor saw that, we're addressing it, and with the reforms that will come in due course, we will make the system better. I am proud of the fact that we can promote and openly promote hope and aspiration and a belief that individuals, our children in our care, can develop as individuals and be positive, productive members of our society. We believe that in our service, as you do, and together 
we can make a difference for them. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And here's where I hand the, the baton over to Geetha. So, Geetha. Thank you, Charlie. Um, we're going to go straight into questions from the floor, if that's OK. So if I take two questions at a time, and if you're able to say who you are and where you're from, that would be very helpful. And if you have a particular panel member you'd like the question to be answered from, please do say. Roving mics at the end there, please. Who's got the roving mic? There we are. If there's another question, please do put your hand up. I'll take two at a time. And there's one back down here after. Thank you. Disminute Association of Yacht Managers Speech and Language Lead. You highlighted the uh, education these children have missed out on. We also know the children in the system, those working with youth offending teams, 60% have speech, language and communication needs. Those in custody, that level is between 60 and 90%. So it's partly a request and, and partly a sort of statement of intent. Given that the research shows this, what are your considerations in terms of ensuring that those young people who are entering custody, every single one of them is assessed by a speech and language therapist because to not do so is illogical because you are trying to work with children whose needs you would not otherwise be aware of. Thank you very That's much. for Michael. Can I take another question and then I'll ask the panel to answer. Was there a hand over here? One at the back there, sorry. Thank you. Hello. Uh, Ian Langley, also uh, Association of Yacht Managers Under Secretary. Um, I was encouraged by uh, the mention of Claire and Michael about smaller custodial units for young people close to home, something we've been asking for a long time. Uh, does this mean you're going to shut YOIs and STCs? Because as we all know, none of, the rest, none of them are safe. I don't think any of them are going to be safe in the future, as per the Oak Hill report this morning. Thank you very much. So we'll take the question on speech and language communication needs in custody talked a lot about the medical provision and the kind of health provision. Is there anything specific on this that um, you're able to share? Charlie? I mean, just briefly, I, I, I absolutely agree, and I made allusion to um, speech language communication uh, difficulties and disorder in my review, uh, and it's absolutely critical that, that children are assessed in a timely fashion, um, both, uh, and I know there's some fantastic work within youth offending teams as well, where they're able to get access. I'm thinking of Blind Agwet Kafili, I think, for example, where they're able to get access to uh, speech therapists who are, who are critical not just in working with the children, but I think almost more important in developing staff's capacity to understand where the, the, in what way the, the difficulties may manifest themselves and how, what they can do as staff members to be able to communicate well with those children. I think it's fair to say we've got a way to go uh, within, uh, within the secure estate, but I think it's something that I'd be very keen to see more of, and I totally agree. Thank you. Um, and in terms of the question, are we shutting YOIs? And I guess we've heard a lot about the reforms. A bit of a timeline may be useful because a workforce change programme is going to take some years, I guess. And there is obviously a question about what do we do with our children today in these establishments as well. So the answer to that question is we'll close YOIs when we've got adequate provision elsewhere. If I'm being completely frank, I might argue that I think we closed too many YOIs too quickly which actually meant we've concentrated our young people in an estate that's actually um, too small at the moment with too many people further from home than we would want uh, and therefore concentrating people in, in a smaller number of places. I, I'd said very clearly, I believe that the, the ambition to develop secure schools is absolutely right and we will work with colleagues to actually deliver that, but in the interim, we have young people, children today, in our care and our responsibility has got to be able to improve the care that they've got in YOIs. So an ambition would be, obviously an ambition would be to have um, no YOIs, secure schools um, across the, the country. That would be a great place to be, um, but the concentration for me at this minute is in dealing with the day-to-day -day realities that we have of young people across the sector. And of course YOIs have got issues around safety, it has to STCs. 
as do children's homes, actually. There's an issue about dealing with very complex children um, across the sector that we uh, are very determined um, to work with. Thank you very much. Can I take two more questions, please, from the floor? There's one lady here at the front and another lady there with a hand up at the front, please. <coughs> yeah, two here. Thank you. Can you put your hand back up, please, so that... The, yeah, there we are. Thank you. Gill from Harry Youth Fending Team. Um, the degree for officers is a really good idea. I don't think it's a bad thing. Um, but in terms of actually addressing the value-based issues of, of staff that work in those secure estates, which clearly at the moment isn't working, I'm really interested to know about what recruitment processes will be considered to address that value base. And also a secondary thing is about young people don't often, because they're used to that kind of behaviour in their homes, often, and they come from that lifestyle, so they don't necessarily report it as much. What will be done to kind of increase that proactive reporting from young people when they are being mistreated in custody? Thank you. And the other hand was somewhere here, please. This lady on the end here. Thank you. Hello, my name's Susan. I'm from a youth offending team. I'm also an IM board, IMB board member. Um, during a visit not too long ago, a young person took his life in an adult prison. Um, and I just wanted to know what plans there were to address the under 21 year olds in adult prison. Thank you very much. So, Claire, do you want to say a little bit more about the kind of workforce development, recruitment, value base that we hope our prison officers yeah. will have going forward? So, as part of recruiting <coughs> new youth justice specialist workers, we want to have a different recruitment and attraction strategy and to look at people with different backgrounds joining the custodial workforce. And all of that work is in train at the moment to plan that. And I, and I take your point about values-based recruitment being helpful in that um, and will definitely be something we will think about. Thank you. Can I Michael, just yes. add to that? Um, I think it's absolutely right that we improve recruitment um, and attract people who want to work specifically with, with uh, children, and that's absolutely right. I do, though, want to challenge the suggestion that there are that the values base for lots of staff who currently work with children is not right. That isn't correct. Of course, what we saw out of Medway and some of that demonstrated that um, that's, that wasn't working properly and there was some very poor behaviour, unacceptable, um, potentially criminal behaviour by people in that establishment. But it is not the case that people working with children across the secure estate at the minute have all got the wrong values. There are lots of incredibly professional, dedicated, and people in all sectors working with young people. I know that because I've been and talked and seen that, and as has anyone who's been around that system. So it's absolutely right. We have a much stronger values-based <coughs> recruitment process. We look to attract people who are, um, want to work with children, who are going to be professionally trained to work with children, but we shouldn't dismiss the dedication of lots of people working in the sector at the minute. Charlie, did you want to say something about transition? Because I know through your work you were looking uh, at... Yeah, I mean, it was, it was one of the really difficult things in my review. There was always a risk of sort of mission creep in different directions, uh, you know, looking further uh, in advance back into the school system and also looking further up into the adult system. And actually, uh, Michael Gave, when he commissioned it, specifically wanted the shut-off to be at 18 because we could have gone further. I mean, what I, what I would say about that is, is that if we can make and prove some really good improvements in the under 18 based secure estate and continue to, with the improvements uh, and the work that's done with youth, youth offending teams, that then my ambition would be uh, that people who are working with older, with young adults, would begin to look at that work and say, well, why aren't we doing that too? But at the moment, that's obviously not a focus of the YJB, but let's get our bit of the sector better and then hope other people can learn from it. Okay, thank you. And Colin, did you have any views from your kind of background in probation and the work of the under-21 cohort, well, what would, they might learn from us? Yeah, well, I don't know about what my, my, I think there's lot they can, lots they can learn from us in terms of uh, uh, working with children and so on, and, and I think they, they are doing that, actually. I think there's, there's, a, there's a lot of discussion across that boundary. I was thinking back to, actually, when I was in, in the world of probation about three years ago, the, the select committee looked at that transition, mm -hmm. the, the, the was, was 18 right and so on, and um, I think the last three or four years has been a period where 
people have gone back and looked at that and said, actually, should it be a hard cut-off or shouldn't it be? And I don't think it ever was, but I think in practice it was being operated as quite a hard cut-off. You got to 18 and, and you were just moved. Um, and uh, uh, I think the YJB at that stage was, was arguing, actually, we needed to be more, be more flexible. And, I th and, and actually, it has operated, and the secure estate has operated more flexibly around that boundary. So there's a little bit of flex around uh, mm. 18 through to potentially 19. Mm. Um, but the estate is as it is, it, it has a finite capacity yeah. um, and there has to be a point at which there's a transition. The key thing, I think, is to, to make sure that they're properly planned for mm. uh, and that, that uh, both parties in terms of the, 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 um, the child uh, secure estate uh, and the, the young adult secure estate are working together in terms of making that transition work. So I think there's been some progress, but it's, it, it, is a, it would be a massive change to switch to say up to 25 which i know many people say is mm. uh, treat everybody up to 25 in the same way yeah, that that's not going to happen overnight and i i would cost an awful lot of money so i think yeah. it's making the existing system work as best as it can is sure. the is the key thing there but. okay i'm going to take two more questions i know we focused a lot on custody so if there are any questions about other bits of transformation that would be good please uh gentlemen at the front please here if that's okay any other questions Okay, just this one here then, please. Thank you. Hi there, I'm David, uh, founder of the Communicate Project, helping yachts to deliver literacy out in the community. I'm very worried about the delivery of institutionalized education in the secure estate. 61% of uh, people are removing themselves from institutionalized education when they've got the ability to. Um, what are we doing to personalize the learning journey within the within secure estate? Because more of the same generic education model isn't going to work with the people we're trying to work with. OK, thank you. And as chair's prerogative, I will ask a question as well then, if that's OK. I suppose um, we have focused a lot on youth custody. Uh, my question, and there's been obviously resources put in, what sort of consideration do we now need to think about in terms of resources for the community angle? Because, of course, there are many young people who are not in custody, and whilst that is the right place to focus on for safeguarding and welfare, there is also another part of the, the system that a number of us work in, and I'd be interested to hear a little bit more about the views on resourcing and transformation in the community sector as well. So that's my question, but if we could take the question first about institutionalised education, uh, any views on that? Who would like to answer? Claire? So I can talk about that. And I think, you know, as part of the reform programme, clearly looking at education is one of the things we want to do and how can we, exactly as you say, tailor it to meet individual needs and rather than expecting everyone to go with what's on offer that we personalise the learning. And I think looking at the scope of the education contracts that we have in the secure estate is definitely within the ambit of the reform programme. I don't have a definite answer about, well, this is what we will do, but exactly as you talked about, working out how we can engage people more effectively by understanding their particular needs that will help them to access education and to succeed is, is something that's within the scope of the programme. I'm very happy to talk about how we, we might do that and to take views on that. Great, thank you. I guess, Colin, I'm going to ask you to answer my question, if that's all right, please. I don't know that I can speak on behalf of government in terms of, of, of resourcing. Um, the YJB's responsibility is clear. It's, it's um, clearly defined. We all understand what that is. So as an accounting officer, um, I get given an amount, of, an amount of money by Parliament, and I'm an accountable to Parliament for the way that money is spent. So it has to be spent for the purposes that it's provided for. Um, where I think the YJB can play a part in that wider question, which I think is an important question, is influencing other people. So spotting where people are operating in stovepipes and not thinking about the feeders and so on. And I think actually yachts already do quite a lot of that. They already blur the boundaries quite deliberately in terms of working with children that are on the cusp of coming into custody. Um, and we all accept that there's a blurring there and, and to some extent don't look too closely at it um, because we don't because that wouldn't be helpful to anybody. Um, but I think we, we can play a role, along with Claire and her colleagues, in, in ensuring that other parts of government recognise that if you don't work with, with, with children in early years mm -hmm. uh, and, and let them down in the way that we all see so often, then they'll end up, unfortunately, in our system. And, and that's, that's the sort of lobbying that we do. Yeah. Um, 
it's the sort of thing that you quite often hear people talking about, but you don't often see delivered in a really tangible way. And I think that's the, the challenge for us all, is how do we get into that space and actually follow through on the intent and make it happen in practice. And I, I, With a freed up um, remit, I think the YJB is much better place to get into that sort of territory. I say that subject to the agreement of the board, obviously, but I think the board will want us to be in that space. Um, because we recognise that actually we, 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 we get a segment of the, the, these children in a part of their life mm. with not much contact with them beforehand and not much contact afterwards. And actually, if we can find a way of, 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 of making it more of a continuum, that must be the right thing to do. But I, I think I saw a nod. Um, but I, 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 think, I think the YJB is probably a better place to, to do that than maybe it's been in the past, where, where it's, it, its responsibilities were actually quite confused, I think. And, and, and sort of grown like topsy without really thinking about the, the reality of it. Great. Thank you all very much. I think that's been a, an absolutely uh, brilliant start to our convention. Really got so, us thinking. I have to say thank you very much for your very honesty about where we're going. Obviously, this is not a simple fix, but there is a huge amount of work going on in this area. So can we thank our panel members? <laughs> thank you. <laughs> So I'm just going to kind of rattle through a little bit about what's going to happen next. We are running a little bit late, but hopefully our seminar guests will uh, just allow me a few moments just to, to maybe say a few things that hopefully start our minds thinking about where we might want to get to after two days at the convention. So for me personally, I worked in yachts, pre-yacht, and actually I recall coming to the very first of the Youth Justice Board conventions, and I have to say, wow. Hasn't the agenda shifted and changed and really transformed? And for some of us, we might say, well, has it gone for the better or for the worse? And I think it's right to say there's been a mixture in all of those things. But what's really, really important for us, I think, is actually how do we collectively now think about some of the positives, but also some of the challenges that we face? And I kind of sort of reflected a little bit about what I think maybe for me would be the things that I would want to focus on and maybe we could use the two days to kind of consider some of these things. We've heard a lot about change. Now, change is one of those words. It's great, or transformation, or all these buzzwords. The thing that I think we have to hold on to is actually not to sweep out all of the old and bring in the new brooms, because sometimes there is something very valuable about history, and there's something very valuable about the culture that we've created in youth offending, and actually, it's really important that we hold on to that history and that culture, but really not being too anxious about the new and the change. And how do we blend those things together so that the solutions we come up with may not be things we've ever tried, but actually they may be the thing that's going to make the big difference and the best outcomes for our children. So for me, it's about let's kind of hold on and respect history. And if we have to make change, is to stomp with respect. And really, that's a strap line for me in all of our work. Uh, and we shouldn't really lose sight of where we've been and where we want to go. The second thing for me, really, is that what we've heard today will take a long time to implement. But there are other parts of local government and central government that are looking for change. And they're looking for change fast. And the speed of change is absolutely everything. But actually, for me, there is something more important than speed. Speed is certainly something we need for some aspects. But there is a model that's called like the happiness path or the, the happiness model. And actually what this teaches us very much is that to try and always do the shortest journey, it might not be the most effective, whilst may seem to be the most efficient. And often those sort of traditional fast, you know, lean models miss what's really quite important, and that's the experience. So if you're always traveling at speed, you miss, you don't stop, you don't smell the roses, you don't see the experience around you, and often you don't get the right response or the right solution. So I think there's something, you know, Einstein would say logic takes you from A to B, but imagination, that will take you everywhere. Today and tomorrow, I think we have a huge opportunity to start to think about what are those desired paths, not what's always the quickest path. And let's take some time to really think about the experience for all of us and our young people to help shape what we might come forward with. My last kind of uh, thing to think through, really, is about the language we use. We all do work very passionately. We work very hard. And it's often very difficult when we get challenged or we see other agencies or other departments who maybe you think are not doing what we think they need to do. 
But actually, we're all in that same space. We're all trying to achieve the same thing. And how we talk about this agenda is really important. How we talk to each other and about each other and about partners is really important. And how we support each other and our staff in the work that they do, which we know is absolutely fundamental to actually making those key differences for young people, is really important. So I don't think we need to be thinking about negative language or this agency is not doing enough or government, they're not doing enough. Let's talk positively because if we talk positively, that has got to have an impact in the way in which we work with young people and the way in which we want young people to see our services because we are trying to make a huge difference. My last thing, as many of you will know in my strap line, I sort of uh, quote this, uh, this challenge to myself probably most mornings. How do we look to knit together all of this space? And we focus today on youth and young people, but what young people are doing in the community in some areas impacts on crime and community safety. It impacts on domestic violence and hate crime. There are huge spreads in the way in which we are working with young people that we mustn't miss an opportunity to see how we knit together with other voluntary sectors, with our community groups, with other statutory agencies. And I think sometimes we get overwhelmed by that knitting and that stitching. Um, and I think for me, one of the things I would challenge all of us to do is not to be scared of what seems like impossibility. If we don't state what's impossible, we will never start to think about what could be possible. So I use the Alice in Wonderland kind of quote and um, I think take it with the, the kind of merit in which it's deemed because actually if we think impossible, we might come up with some new ways of working. We might be able to think about the things that have really worked in the last 17 years and also try and think a little bit about where we want to go collectively. So that's my kind of uh, starter for 10 and I hope that that will help us set the tone for the way in which we want to work for the next two days. We are now going to go into seminars. You do have your seminars in your conference uh, packs. Hopefully you've identified the ones you want to go to. All the rooms are out, this, out of that back door and either upstairs or, or elsewhere. I will just say after the workshops, you will have time for lunch and please use the time to network. Obviously, there are a number of very, very key critical players in this field that will want to hear from us and we need to make sure we use that opportunity to talk to them. And finally, before you all move, <coughs> just to say during lunch, there is a mindfulness session. I think it's really important that we look at this in real seriousness. We're doing it with young people. Young people are finding it very, very powerful and very useful. And my staff in youth offending are also finding it very useful. So please go along, see what it's about. Uh, and I hope you enjoy the next couple of hours together in your workshop. So thank you very much.